support for the progress. Praise the living God. And uh, I'm so glad that we can join in once again to be able to learn together. And uh, my prayer is that uh, as we continue learning these things, they will resonate with our minds and um, we will be able to continue seeking the Lord in prayer and um, knowing his perfect will upon our lives. This is um, the series, uh, The Prophets uh, and the Messengers. And uh, this is number 10 in this series. And what we are looking at is verbal inspiration or thought inspiration. This is part one of three in the same topic as um, we continue with uh, the studies that uh, we are having. And so uh, I just want us to offer a word of prayer and then uh, be able to share together what the Lord has for us at this hour. Shall we uh, pray uh, as we start this? Our Heavenly Father, all glory and honor belong unto thee. And so lay the glory of man in dust that uh, thou alone may be exalted and the name of Jesus Christ may be manifested in our lives. And so I pray that uh, you may speak through me and to me, the Lord, we may be benefited by this session in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, um. I love uh, Seventh-day Adventist history, and it is something that uh, really fascinates me every time that I go through it, because the issues that I'm dealing with, they are not new issues. They are issues that has been there, and uh, there are people who have dealt with these issues, and I'm trying just to uh, amplify what has been spoken of by the people who are before me. And uh, in this age, there are not many people who love reading. And so we are trying to turn these uh, materials into videos. Number 10 in the series, The Prophets and the Messengers. And uh, this is part one of three in verbal inspiration or thought inspiration. There, there has been uh, a lot of subjects that the Lord used uh, E.G. White to understand. The problem has been that her writings are not read in context. Uh, and uh, in this uh, presentation, I have uh, taken some excerpts from uh, the book uh, Messenger of the Lord by Herbert Douglas and various resources uh, to bring to us the study of verbal inspiration or thought inspiration, a case study, if E.G. White was a true messenger of the Lord. And so some of the things that um, I'll be looking at, and uh, you can always really ask for the materials and uh, they'll be given uh, freely. This is a gospel sound as kindling reformation presentation. And uh, uh, some of the things that I'll be dealing with is uh, uh, verbal or uh, thought inspiration, a case of plagiarism, borrowing and inspiration was Ellen White different from other canonical messengers? Lesser light versus greater light issue, degrees of inspiration, canonical versus non-canonical, a case of infallibility and biblical models of inspiration. When we are supposed, when are we supposed to quote E.G. White and why did why did E.G. White have editors? These are some of the things that um, I'll be trying to handle in this three parts of uh, verbal or thought inspiration and. Uh, my prayer is that um, we, we may approach things soberly because there is always quarreling and uh, a lot of things just happening amongst us that if uh, we were serious with our mission, then uh, it will be something so different and uh, we will accomplish what the Lord has uh, brought us on this earth to accomplish. And so um, God communicated his messages not through mechanical dictation, but through acts and words that men and women could understand. The prophets who had God speak directly to them conveyed these messages through the 
thought process of their day and through the idioms and analogies that uh, their hearers could understand. Understanding the revelation or inspiration process correctly prevents distressful concern when people see in the gospel clear differences between reports of the same event, even the same message of Jesus. Nothing really disturbs some sincere student more than to observe the different ways Bible writers describe the same event, uh, uh, quote the same conversation or report the parables of Jesus. Even having two versions of the Lord's Prayer as recorded in Matthew 6 and Luke 11 upsets those uh, who mistakenly believe that the Bible writers wrote word for word as the Holy Spirit dictated uh, to them. And so uh, I'd like to say uh, this in the beginning that uh, I'd like to say that verbal inherent inspiration implies that uh, the prophet is a recording machine transmitting mechanically and unerringly God's message. Belief in mechanical inspiration forbids differences in reporting a message or event. Verbal inspiration requires prophets to transmit the exact words supplied by the heavenly guide, even as a court stenographer types what is being said by the witnesses. No room is given to prophets to use their own individuality and limitations in expressing the truths reveal to them. That, that is essentially what we call verbal inspiration, just giving out the thing in a verbatim form the way actually you have been given. And so there is no thinking, there is no thought process of the things. You, you just report. Like I will say, thus saith the Lord. That is, and when I start, thus saith the Lord, then it means that I'll report verbatim without correcting anything, without trying to understand anything, without uh, giving out my own idea. One of the obvious problems for those who believe in verbal inspiration is what to do in translating the Bible, either from Old Testament Hebrew Aramaic or New Testament Greek into other languages. Another problem is um, when you look at Matthew 27 verse 9, and verse 10, where Matthew refers to Jeremiah rather than Zechariah 11, 12, as the Old Testament source for a messianic prophecy. This might be a copist mistake. But if it is Matthew's, it is a human mistake any teacher or minister might make, a mistake that will cause no problem for thought inspirations. But you will find that it will cause a problem with verbal inspiration. Why? Because thought inspirations know what Matthew meant. And uh, the, the verbal inspiration, they'll say, if this was really a messenger or a prophet, why did he just paint what God had not said? Or why did he make even a mistake? Or even you can look at uh, what Pilate actually wrote, wrote on the sign placed on Christ's cross. Uh, this is something that uh, can be discussed and uh, argued about. In Matthew 27, 37, Mark 15, 26, and Luke 23, 38, and John 19, 19, they report the sign differently. To thought inspirationists, the message is clear. To verbal inspirationists, there is a problem. And that is what Herbert Douglas says in uh, uh, Messenger of the Lord in page uh, 16, um, that uh, this will actually bring a lot of problem. So uh, when you talk about... Um, verbal inspiration and thought inspiration, um, there can be no case of borrowing anything from anyone. And uh, we have to understand one thing that when God speaks to prophets, he does not install a dictionary or an encyclopedia in their minds. Prophet, prophets take the inspired message and do their best to convey that message in a language and thought forms that will do justice to the message. Some such as Peter needed others to help them with their grammar. Others such as Luke gathered as much as they could from contemporary sources in order to set forth the truth that burned within them. Paul used a contemporary uh, or used contemporary writers to better establish conduct with his 
Grecian audiences. And then Old Testament writers often depended on oral reports or earlier documents in preparing their messages. Moses did not need visions to describe the story of his birth or to recount the historical narratives uh, he placed in Genesis. The books of Joshua and Judges were probably compiled during David's monarchy, according to internal evidence. So the authors of Kings and Chronicles obviously used sources that they often re referenced. And uh, as a matter of fact, the authors at times quoted from other Old Testament books without crediting their sources. And you can compare 2 Kings 19, 1 and verse 2 with Isaiah 37, 1, to 1 and 2, and 1 Chronicles 10, 1 to 3 with uh, 1 Samuel 31, 1 to 3. And so if we are talking about um, verbal inspiration, then there is no room for the prophets taking from other prophets and not even referring to them. That will be called plagiarism. The New Testament presents many instances of borrowing from non-biblical sources, such as the wisdom of Solomon, uh, first Enoch testimonies of the 12 patriarchs and the Palestinian Targums. And then we have the issue of E.G. White because the issue is, uh, was this a true prophet? If he was a true prophet, how do we take her writings and how do we quote her and give to the people? Are we to take her as if she was verbally inspired or uh, it is her thoughts which were inspired? And uh, if the prophets were verbally inspired and not in, uh, uh, inspired by thoughts, then uh, you know we even don't have a room of interpreting or uh, um, simplifying what they wrote because you will be doing away with uh, what is divinely actually uh, 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 um, uh, done what verbally uh, given or dictated in that case. Ellen White herself portraitly explained why she used various historians as she traced the history of the great controversy in the past ages. And uh, she wrote, in pursuance of uh, this purpose, I have endeavored to select and group together events in the history of the church in such a, a manner as to trace the unfolding of the great testing truth that at different periods have been given to the world. Now, quoting uh, uh, Herbert Douglas in Messenger of the Lord, this is uh, what uh, we are told by Herbert Douglas. He says, how did she use these historians? She noted, in some cases where a historian has so grouped together events as to afford in brief a comprehensive view of the subject or has summarized details in a convenient manner, his words have been quoted. But in some instances, no specific credit has been given seen the quotations are not given for the purpose of citing that writer as authority, but because his statement affords a ready and possible presentation of the subject. In narrating the experience and views of those carrying forward the work of reform in our time, our own time, similar use has been made of their published works, Messenger of Light, Messenger of the Lord, page 378 to 379. And so the work of the prophet is not actually to give credit to the people who have been uh, given information by the Lord and have written about things. They are not uh, to exalt these writers because people can think that these writers have accurate information per se and that information has no errors and take everything that they have written. But when the messenger of the Lord is being directed to take this information from this historian by God, he takes it without the credit to the historian, but uh, to the Lord himself who have directed the messenger to take the inf that information from the historical book of uh, that historian. And in some cases, when uh, the portion of the history is um, deemed to be the whole uh, uh, correct, then uh, 
you see like in the great controversy, they were able to cite the reference that they, they were getting uh, the material uh, uh, from. And so it is not an issue of exalting the historian, but um, uh, taking the reference and the material that the Lord was able to enable them at that time to pen down. As all prophets did, Ellen White had to supply the human language to convey the grand thoughts and uh, uh, arcing panoramas that uh, she either saw in vision or sensed in some other times of divine communication. And um, her capacity to supply appropriate language and style matured as the years went by. As any study of her personal manuscript and published writings will indicate, she grew in her understanding of subjects. Uh, at times, she recognized that others had written with beauty and precision on certain subjects that she wanted to make clear in her writings. To better clothe to those divinely revealed truths, she utilized borrowed expressions. Speed, truth, along with as uh, such human grace as possible were her compelling motivation. Her main work was not to um, take the sublime language, sublime language, and it be at the forefront of what she was doing, but her main purpose and the main purpose of all the prophets was to take the message that the Lord had given to them either through visions, dreams, or taking some materials from others and um, bring in the idea in a way that even a child could be able to read and uh, 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 be convicted of um, their salvific ones in these messages and start pursuing Jesus Christ and not the writer per se, but looking unto Jesus Christ who is the author and finisher of our, way, our faith. And so some have raised two questions regarding both biblical writers and Ellen White writings. How does borrowing affect the authority of the writer? Does the borrowed material become inspired? The question arises because inspiration is misunderstood as mechanical dictation or verbal inspiration. But I want to point us to how even the canonical writers were able to use the materials of other people who are not inspired, but just took the history that was before them and it ended up in the Bible. And so where else can I take you if it is not in the book of Luke chapter one then? For so much as many have taken in hand to set forth in order a declaration of those things which are most assuredly believed among us, even as they delivered them unto us, which from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word, it seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write unto thee in order, most excellent Theophilus that thou mightest know the certainty of those things wherein thou hast been instructed. So here we have Luke writing a manuscript to Theophilus, who was a bishop, uh, I believe, in Antiochus. Um, and so he writes to him, according to the account of the information he has received, most probably from other writers who may not have been, and we know, they were not inspired by God, but they were just writing an account of history on what happened in the life of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, his life, his work, and even his death, as a historian can write it. And so Luke says, I'm taking this information, putting it in chronological order, and give to you an account that is believed by many according to the information that is outside there. Luke pursuing the same thing, he goes into the book of Acts, the same writer in the book of Acts, he goes ahead and say, the former treatise have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach, until the day in which he was taken up, after that he through the Holy Ghost had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen. 
And so this is a historian writing a treatise and a manuscript to somebody who is searching the truth. And he has collected an account of the events in Jesus' life. And he gives us a manuscript or a letter to this bishop. And then this ends up in an inspired book of God, which means, and Luke, we never find Luke saying that he had a vision of writing what he wrote in the book of Luke and the book of Acts. And so we know that this is not a verbal inspiration, but a thought inspiration, and not only a thought inspiration, but an accurate collection of history and the truth, and it ended up, the, up in the Bible. And so we cannot say that because E.G. White took some history and had her writings, and then he says that it is the spirit of prophecy or it is the message from the Lord, then she is a false prophet and she is a plagiarist. In fact, when Luke says that he has collected material, he doesn't say, I collected this material from this and this. He says that I'm, I'm writing to you something that I have collected in it is order. And he doesn't go about naming who he got the information from. So how does the material of Luke appear in the Bible, yet they were not verbally inspired, and yet we will refuse the materials of E.G. White because she took the material of somebody and didn't borrow. If we have to reject then her writing, we will have to start with rejecting the account of Luke to Theophilus. And uh, I just wanted to pass that across because uh, these are the some of the things that arise when we talk about the prophets and the messengers of the Lord. And so probably the two questions will not be asked if it were understood that prophets are permitted to find the best methods at their disposal to convey the thoughts God has given unto them. We will not be arguing about plagiarism. Is this what she wrote inspired or were it her own thoughts? So what then is the value of borrowed material as even we see Luke borrowed and it appeared in the, in the, in the inspired book or the Bible? Another issue I want us to think about how this letter ended up in the Bible and look at the letters of E.G. White, which she wrote personally to the people who are in various problems and mistakes, how they have been able not only to help the particular people that were written to them, but also as we read accounts of them, take an example, a letter written to a brother who was practicing self-abuse, a letter which was written to a brother who was practicing incest and all other stuff and how she was able even to borrow some doctor's reports on uh, the effects of uh, self-abuse that is masturbation and the effects of incest from proven scientific data and she never uh, 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 sometimes quoted these people and gave their names, but in some instances, like uh, in uh, testimonies to sexual behaviors, we find that she quoted these people. Y you find that, uh, how do we take that now, those materials she borrowed as truth and uh, as inspired when she says that her material are inspired? She was guided to go and take those material or to borrow that material, why? because they are scientific truth. And who is the author of true science? It is God who inspires this man, even though they are misusing this science, he is still the same God who has given them brain to think. He is the same God who has given them oxygen so that they may be alive to write these things. So God has preserved them to do what they are doing. And instead of taking the prophet through all this, he has already done it through some people who may be misusing that information, but then uh, moves the servants that he has to be able to take that material and bring the data together because it is his, he, it, it steals his materials. So what then is the value of borrowed material we may ask ourselves? It seems logical that if God revealed his message to the prophets, he will also assist them in conveying the message in human language. Ellen White noted that God guided the mind in the selection of what to speak and what to write. The treasure was entrusted to earth and vessel, yet it is nonetheless from heaven. And then uh, here 
uh, Herbert Douglas uh, goes ahead and uh, says this very insightful uh, 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 passage. In a way, God did not expect the biblical writer to reinvent the wheel. He led Paul to borrow from the Apocrypha in developing a substantial part of Romans chapter 1. He led him to find useful material, at least to hear us in his day, in the Jewish Tagums, Aramaic translation or paraphrase of a portion of the Old Testament in developing 1 Corinthians 10, 1 to 4 and 2 Timothy 3, 8. He led John to find generous help from contemporary sources such, such as the Targums and one Enoch. If the language already available seemed to help the biblical author to speed his message preparation along, he prudently borrowed from his purpose. No doubt many of his contemporaries um, recognized quickly from where the writer had borrowed his material. To the receivers of the prophet's message, such a borrowing was no problem. They saw the big picture of the writer's uh, message. That is Herbert Douglas in the uh, uh, the book, uh, The Messenger of uh, the Lord. And so instead of uh, God taking these people through a lot of things, what he had just to do is direct them to borrow from the already material that was there. Likely, many in Christ's day recognize his reference to extra biblical sources that he used to develop his messages, messages that were truly original. But his use of sources had nothing to do with the authority or originality of uh, his messages. Here, Doug, Doug, um, Herbert Douglas also says something that is worth of quoting in Messenger of the Lord, page 379 to 370. 80, and I'll quote from that book again. Herbert Douglas says, does, um, does borrowed material become inspired only in the sense that it assists the writer to state his message more clearly? This may lead to another question. Why did Paul and John give credit to the authors of the borrowed material? Perhaps they believed, as did Ellen White, that every gleam of thought, every flash of intellect is from the light of the world. This conviction that God is the author of all truth may have been one reason for not feeling the need to reference their frequent borrowings. Message of the Lord, page 379 to 380. Prophets obviously mix common everyday information with the divine message. When Paul referred, referred to contemporaries with appreciation, that was not the divine message. When he asked Timothy to find the cloak and books that he had left at Trowers, and to come before winter, that was common, everyday talk, 2 Timothy 4, 9 to 21. When we read the genealogy of the families of Israel since Adam, we are reading common historical information, not a message given by revelation, 1 Chronicles 1, 8. And uh, Herbert Douglas continues to say, when Ellen White recognized this distinction between ordinary information and the divine message, there are times when common things must be stated, Common thoughts must occupy the mind. Common letters must be written and information given that has passed from one to another of the workers. Such a words, such a information are not given under the special inspiration of the Spirit of God. Questions are asked at times that are not upon religious subject at all, and these questions must be answered. We converse about houses and lands, trades to be made, and locations for our institutions, their advantages and disadvantages. And so things may appear in the writings which are of common order. We should understand that uh, these are, God has not taken away the individualities of the people. God has left them to have that individuality just to be used as earthen vessels to pass messages to the people. This distinction appeared in 1909 later when Ellen White was uh, troubled about the former manager of the Paradise Valley Sanitarium, E.S. Ballinger. She wrote that Ballinger was denying the testimonies as a whole because of what seemed to him as inconsistent. A statement made by me in regard to the number of rooms in the Paradise Valley Sanitarium, that is, Sister White made um, a statement in regard to the number of rooms in Paradise Valley Sanitarium, which was found that that was not the accurate number. And then E.S. Bellinger said that a prophet cannot be this inconsistent. 
yet these were common matters being discussed. And so in earlier letter, she had commended that the sanitarium had 40 rooms when it had only 38, a difference of two rooms. And so this is what um, she was able to write. Um, this is what she had to write on this matter. And remember, we are looking, this is uh, number 10 in the series, the prophets and the messengers. And this is one uh, presentation of three presentations on verbal or thought inspiration. So E.G. White said on this issue concerning the, the rooms that were there and uh, common matters being discussed in a common way, the information given concerning the number of rooms in the Paradise Valley Sanitarium was given, not as a revelation from the Lord, but simply as a human opinion. There has never been revealed to me the exact number of rooms in any of our sanitariums, and the knowledge I have obtained of such a things I have gained by inquiring of those who are supposed to know. For one to mix the sacred with the common is a great mistake. In a tendency to do this, we may see the working of the enemy to destroy souls. And so people will take common materials, and in these common materials, there can be an error in them, and then they say, if this really is a message of the Lord and the prophet of the Lord, and this is uh, the some of the key inconsistencies they have, then how can we believe their materials? Students of prophetic writings should know how to separate the sacred from the common. Sometimes the question is asked in terms of what is inspired and what is not. Obviously, the, distinct, the distinction should not be based on whether we agree with a particular portion of a prophet's writings. So the 1909 incident regarding the rooms of the Paradise Valley Sanitarium is one example of a common reference. Other examples are found in Miss White's hundreds of letters wherein she spoke of uh, the weather, shopping list, the garden, or her grandchildren. But sooner or later, she will direct the reader's thoughts to his or her spiritual needs or some church activity. That shift will be a clear signal to readers that they were now listening to a message that went beyond common themes. Talking about this, uh, Herbert uh, Douglas has to say this, and uh, I'm borrowing heavily from uh, that book. He said, only a small percentage of Ellen White's published writing deal with common topics, as anyone may readily see. She could write in these letters which I write, in the testimonies I bear, I am presenting to you that which the Lord has presented to me. I did not write one article in the paper expressing merely my own ideas. They are what God has opened before me in vision, the precious rays of light shining from the throne. It is true concerning the articles in our papers and in the many volumes of my books. So if it was a direct message from the Lord, she could tell her audience or when she is writing in the paper, she could state that this is the message from the Lord. And I'm, uh, I'm writing not my own ideas, but I'm writing what um, the Lord has uh, told me to write. And so... Sometimes Miss White could not make a distinction between the inspiration of her books, uh, articles or letters where they are giving spiritual counsel. And uh, you will find that she had mixed common ideas, like she will just start writing to somebody, converses about business to, and uh, some of the things happening. And then she could enter into a mode of counseling. And so she could not distinguish between the common and the inspired, but a keen reader of her material will know that the line that he has ended in was not a mere business talk, but uh, it was something that touched on salvational issues. And so this eliminates the position some have made that only her books are inspired. Those talking, those taking that position, taking that position, forget that much in her books was first written in article form. And uh, further, it is clearly the case that Bible writers mix extra biblical sources with their vision-based messages. One cannot then dismiss a prophet's work simply because some portion of the book contains materials from sources other than divine revelation. 
if prophets, prophets include the writings of others to better express truth, that material is not understood as merely common in the sense we have been using the term. And so the work of explaining the Bible by the Bible itself is the work that should be done by all our ministers who are fully awake to the times in which we live. And then uh, if uh, people are finding a problem with E.G. White's materials, then E.G. materials will interpret E.G. materials. That there is something that we have to understand, and she should be subject to the Bible. In her personally written introduction to the Great Controversy, you will find that uh, Ellen White recorded how the scenes of the long continued conflict between good and evil had been revealed to her. And that preface is something to really resonate with us. You go read the preface of the Great Controversy, it is not just an ordinary writing. And so um, she says that from time to time, I have been permitted to behold the working in different ages of the great controversy between Christ and Satan. When she is writing about the preface itself before she enters into the material and start even citing or quoting from uh, 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 historians. And so how did she behold these mighty sins? She, she says that as the spirit of God has opened to my mind, the great truth of his word and the sins of the past and the future, I have been bidden to make known to others that which has thus been uh, revealed. And so Hubbard Douglas poses a question here, and uh, it will be better to read from what uh, he says. And by the way, you can go and read The Messenger of the Lord, the book by Hubbard Douglas. It's a wonderful book to read and you'll understand more about uh, E.G. White. So how much detail did she see? The evidence is that she saw the great scenes, but that the details involving dates, perhaps even geographical sites, she did not always see. The same was true for Isaiah as he struggled for words to describe the throne of God in Isaiah chapter 6. And for Daniel as he tried to describe the awesome vision of beasts and horns et al., E.G. White saw the big picture, the basic concept, the overall sweep of the forces of good and uh, evil played out in human history. Her task was to fill in this big picture through research in the biblical story and in common sources of historical uh, information. Just as God did not give Daniel words to describe the beast of Daniel 7, so he did not give Ellen White the historical dates and events to fill in the great controversy story. Even as Luke searched out the base sources to, to, to complete his life of Christ, Luke chapter 1 to 4, so Miss White did what all prophets do when they had a message that had to be conveyed in human words and comprehended by historically oriented men and women. Thus, we look to look not necessarily for historical accuracy for all statements made, but for his contribution to the bigger picture, the message about the ministry of Jesus. Quoting from Messenger of Lord, page 386 and to 386, uh, uh, 386.3 to 386.5. Now, Herbert Douglas writes, will there be instances of possible errors? Probably. Henry Alford, the highly respected author of New Testament for English readers, wrote, Two men may be equally led by the Holy Spirit to record the events of our Lord's life for our edification. Though one may believe one record, though one may believe and record that the visit to Gadarenes took place before the calling of Matthew, while the other places it after the event. Though one is narrating it speaks of two demoniacs, the other only of one. And not only of the arrangements of the evangel evangelic history are these remarks to be understood. There are certain minor points of accuracy or inaccuracy of which human research suffices to inform men and on which from one of the research it is often the practice to speak vaguely or uh, and inexactly. Such are sometimes the conventionally received distances from place to place. 
such as the common accounts of phenomena in natural history et al. Now, etc. I mean, now, in matters of this kind, the evangelists and apostles were not supernaturally informed, but left in common with others to the guidance of their natural faculties. The treasure is ours in all its richness, but it is ours as only it can be ours in the imperfections of human speech, in the limitations of human thought, in the variety incident first to individual character and then to manifold transcription and the lapse of ages. In other words, the human face of the divine human communication system will be beset with occasional discrepancies, simply because of human fi finiteness. Stephen's eloquent sermon, Acts 7, contains an incidental reference to the number 75 of Jacob's family who went into Egypt to live with Joseph. However, the Genesis reference, 46:27, of, uh, however, the different the Genesis reference for 627 states that 70 of Jacob's family went into Egypt. What shall we make of this difference? If we believe that G Genesis is the only historical source that Jews in the first century had for this information, then we simply understand that the Holy Spirit or the spirit of prophecy guided C Stephen in reciting the big picture but did not intervene on details. Prophets do not necessarily become authorities on historical data. Their inspirational value lies in the messages, not in some of the details that are incidental to big picture. And I'll be able to illustrate this in a, a while, in a little moment. Mother has never laid claim to verbal inspiration. And I do not find that my father or Elder Bates, Andrew Smith, or Wagner put forth this claim. If there were verbal inspiration in writing her manuscript, why should there be on her part the work of addition or adaptation? It is a fact that mother often takes one of her manuscripts and goes over it thoughtfully, making additions that develop the thought still further. And then we will talk about um, why did she have an editor if she had verbal inspiration? Why not just write it and put it out instead of correcting grammar and all this stuff? Mother's contact with European people had brought to her mind scores of things that had been presented to her in vision during past years, some of them two or three times and other scenes many times. Her seeing of historic places and her conduct with the people refreshed her memory with reference to, the, to these things. And so she desired to add much material to the book, The Great Controversy. Quoting in a Messenger of the Lord 387 paragraph 6 to 388 paragraph 2, Herbert Douglas says this. A few months later, Willie White wrote to S.N. Haskell, a stalwart pioneer who leaned dangerously toward a verbal inspiration viewpoint at that time. Regarding mother's material writings, she has never wished our brethren to treat them as authority on the dates or details of history. When a great controversy was written, she oftentimes gave a partial description of some scene presented to her. And when Sister Davis made inquiry regarding time and place, Mother referred to what was already written in the books of Uriah Smith and in secular histories. When controversy was written, Mother never thought that the readers would take it as authority on historical dates and use it to settle controversies. And she does not now feel that it ought to be used in that way. I'll just um, point out one instance also in the Bible about uh, history and uh, accuracy of numbers and uh, uh, what we may call uh, historical data. And uh, I'll, uh, I'll be able to go into the New Testament and give you something that um, you may be familiar with. Just uh, give me a minute. Uh, in the book of Mark um, chapter nine, in the book of Mark chapter nine, just allow me to open it. There's something interesting when we come to accuracies of uh, how people report things when we are talking about history, numbers, and all that stuff. 
Look at what it says in the book of Mark chapter 9. And he said to them, Verily I say unto that there be some of them that stand here, which shall not taste of death till they have seen the kingdom of God come with power. Verse 2, And after six days Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up into an high mountain apart by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. Now, let us read of the same account in another book. And uh, let us see what it has to say uh, about it in, uh, in the book of, um, this is um, the book of Luke chapter 9. That was Mark chapter 9. But look, let us look at Luke chapter 9. Now, in Luke chapter 9, Verse 27, it says, But I tell you of truth, there be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the kingdom of God. And it came to pass about an eight days after these things, after these sayings, he took Peter and John and James and went up into a mountain to pray. And as he prayed, the passion of his countenance was altered, and his raiment was white and glistering. And behold, there talked with him two men which were Moses and Elias. Now, just go back to the book of Mark, and then we find, and his raiment became shining, exceeding white as snow, so as snow fuller on earth can, can white them. And there appeared unto them Elias with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. When you go forward, you find that um, there was there who, uh, the, in Luke chapter 9, Uh, if you go in Luke chapter 9, we find that uh, and uh, there was who? Moses and Elias. The same events in the book of Mark, we have six days. In the book of uh, Luke, we have eight days. Now, who is inspired of these two? If we talk about verbal inspiration, which one will we take? Is it six days or will we take eight days? I want you to think about that when we are dealing with messengers and the prophets of the Lord. So, Sister White, when she is writing, you may find that the figures are not correct in some of her writings because it, it's not that figures uh, per se that we are looking at, but the bigger picture. And so, if we were told to, 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 to take uh, between Mark and Luke, and somebody will challenge me that term, the, the, the way we can reconcile that is by inclusive reckoning. And it is good that we can take that, but then uh, you, you won't say that this is verbal inspiration because one has six and another one has about eight. That is not verbal in uh, 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 inspiration actually, but uh, it is, um, inclusive reckoning where actually people can talk about this number and this number, and then uh, there is a harmony that can be reconciled. And so when we are talking about verbal inspiration and thought inspiration, let us think about these discrepancies that are there, seeming discrepancies in the Bible, and uh, Matthew's quoting uh, 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 Zechariah and saying that it is Jeremiah and all this stuff, and Isaiah having a problem with this and that. It is not about verbal inspiration but actually the thought inspiration and so Willie White writing to S.N. Haskell he, he tells him that mother had never regarded her materials as uh, a verbal inspiration and it should be taken as authority in the dates and figures and so um, Willie White continuing to write and being quoted by uh, Herbert Douglas, this is uh, what uh, he says. Uh, it seems to me that uh, there is a danger of placing altogether too much stress upon chronology. 
if it had been essential to the salvation of men that he human beings should have a clear and harmonious understanding of the chronology of the world, the Lord will not have permitted the disagreements and discrepancies which we find in the writings of the Bible historians. And it seems to me that in this last day, there ought not to be so much controversy regarding deaths. I believe, Brother Haskell, that there is danger of our injuring mother's work by claiming for it more than she claims for it, more than father even claimed for it, more than either J. N. Andrews, J. H. Wagner, or Uriah Smith ever claimed for it. The same day, Willie White wrote virtually identical letter to W. W. Eastman, publishing director at the Southern Publishing Association. But in closing the letter, he added, I have overwhelmingly, over, I have overwhelming evidence and conviction that they are the descriptions and delineation of what God has revealed to her in a vision and where she has followed the descriptions of historians or the expositions of administrators, I believe that God has given her discernment to use that which is correct and in harmony with truth regarding all matters essential to salvation. If it should be found by faithful study that she has she has followed some exposition of prophecy, which in some detail regarding dates we cannot harmonize with our understanding of secular history. It does not influence my confidence in her writings as a whole any more than my confidence in the Bible is influenced by the fact that I cannot harmonize many of the biblical statements regarding chronology. In summary, for verbal inspirationist Ellen White's writings unfortunately have become an authority on historical dates and places. For thought, inspirationists that will be an unwarranted use of prophets of a prophet's works. Thought inspirationists focus on the bigger picture or in the big on the big picture, the message, possibly discrepancies in historical details are considered incidental to the message and of minor importance. And uh, uh, as we bring this to a close, just quoting M or L 388 to 389, everyone's want to be understood. Often misunderstandings arise when a statement has been lifted out of context. Thus, everyone who has been misunderstood appeals to fairness and asks that the context be considered. Context includes both internal and external clues that will establish the truth about any statement under consideration. Internally, we usually get a clear picture of what an author meant by reading the words, sentences, paragraphs, even chapters surrounding a puzzling statement. Externally, we ask further questions that may help us to understand, such as when, where, why, and perhaps how. Time, place, and circumstances apply to the external context, as uh, we shall be seeing uh, soon in this uh, presentation. And so I want to finish by saying this, that um, most of the things that we argue about, uh, about E.G. White and uh, any other people who have been given some materials uh, or messages from the Lord, are um, actually going into details that can be harmonized by either ignoring the consistencies, maybe in figures and numbers, or uh, not uh, looking at the bigger picture of what is being conveyed, uh, like uh, in the case of Mark saying six days and in the case of Luke saying about eight days. Somebody will hang on these two numbers and uh, this is what even the atheists do and say, how can an inspired book have two writers writing the same incident but having different figures? And they throw away the baby with the towel and the, the bath the bat water, bat water. And so these are the things that we must be careful about when approaching the Bible and even approaching E.G. White materials. Are they verbally inspired or it is the thoughts that were inspired in the um the the messengers wrote and the prophets wrote what they could actually remember for the bigger picture of salvation and not for uh, uh, the accuracy of the figures and the numbers given there in and so may the Lord continue helping us as um, uh, we continue 
looking at EG White? Verbal or thought inspiration? When uh, we shall uh, continue, we shall be looking at the issue of uh, uh, the lesser light versus the greater light and uh, how the people in her day uh, look at this issue and uh, uh, how can we take the non-canonical materials uh, as inspired when uh, actually they are not in the Bible. But uh, that one I had tackled also and I'll just briefly go through it because um, it's not something to give us a big problem per se. Bearing in mind that um, there has been a prophecy which has been made in Joel that in the latter days, God shall give visions, dreams to his servants. And uh, uh, this shall be true accounts of uh, inspiration from the Lord. And will we reject them? Because what they'll be talking about is not written in the Bible. It is non-canonical. Far be it that we can take such a position. And so may the good Lord bless us and may he continue guiding us into all truth and um, that we may know what we believe, we may know how to defend it, and we may be a people who shall not be caught up with uh, things that will not lead us to seek Christ more but spend so much time disputing among us ourselves as uh, souls are hurried into perdition while we are really uh, disputing about things that uh, uh, have no significance. But you may ask, why are you presenting this if it has no significance? So that it may help us expand our minds on how we think about these things. Otherwise, the Lord bless us. And uh, shall we close with... Um, a word of prayer. Our dear Father in heaven, thank you once again for uh, this session and thank you for working through these feeble instruments, Lord. And so I pray that uh, whoever shall come across this material, Lord, that they may be blessed and uh, they may see the bigger picture of what you are trying to speak to your children. We are living in solemn days. Help us to spend time with Jesus Christ that we may be not deceived by the enemy of souls by spending times in things that will not bring a, a closer relationship with you. Your name be glorified. Continue seeing us through these hard times and help us have the inner peace that Christ promised in John chapter 14, verse 27. This is my request in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. And uh, until then, Bye for now.